Hey, what's up everybody? Video 44 coming at you another video. All right, so we got an update on LeBron James. Uh, the news is very good. No structural damage. Surgery will not be required. And we expect it not to be season ending. Uh, so that's the news. That's what we're rolling with. Uh, he heard a pop. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. It's a lot of stuff. When I see stuff like this, BDF44's brain just automatically assumes people are putting things aside not necessarily doing what probably should be done for the betterment of the player's health because of the circumstances at hand. That's what I think is actually what what people choose to do in these situations a lot of times. I felt the same way about AD's injury. Oh, he's going to be fine in two weeks. Yeah, because we're going to force him back. Bron's going to be fine in two weeks. Yeah, because we're going to force him back. I think that's what's going on. That's why Darvin is uh, telling people he ain't hear nobody hear nothing about a pop. Plausible deniability. He didn't say it. Didn't happen. So, <clears throat> you know, if he's willing to, to, to do that, I'm fine with it because at the end of the day, he's at the tail end of his career. You know what I mean? So, hey, this is a, a billionaire who's making a, a choice to come back from an injury that could keep him out for the rest of his career. And that's what it is. Whatever diagnosis comes about, whatever, you know, it's good news. We're happy to hear good news. But I, I didn't necessarily expect to hear bad news. Even if it was bad news, I expect to hear a lie. So, Take that for what it's worth. Now, <clears throat> at this point, we're going to take that news and we're going to run with it. And we're going to be appreciative of the fact that we have a possible chance at LeBron returning. And why is that a possible chance? Didn't I just say that he's definitely not ending his season? All that should be just fine. He's coming back, right? We're never assuming it's not a lie. So why would it be possible? Because if we lose too much, ain't no reason to bring him back. If we go on a seven, eight game losing streak, which nobody actually expects. But if for some reason we do fall off a cliff that bad, we ain't bringing him back. To what? We'll be mathematically out. He's not chasing Kareem. What are we doing? Stacking him on top, stacking more, uh, uh, you know, scoring numbers on top of the record. With an injury, I just, nah. He would obviously then be shut down, and we would see what happens um, with AD after that, because I'm pretty sure we'd probably be looking to shut him down, too, if we fall all the way out of things. Uh but I don't, I don't anticipate that. You guys follow me. You know, the video I made this morning is basically essentially saying I still think we're a good team without a, uh, LeBron James. Now, we can't keep losing people after this. <laughs> if we're still 100% healthy sans LeBron James, I think this is a playoff team. You start removing more players from it from here, we're in real trouble. So, for me, uh, that's just going to be the key. Uh, making sure that we use everybody. We got a deep team. A team that I don't really feel bad about playing a single soul on it. Uh, which then, which means we can lean on whoever the hot hand is, uh, fluctuate players. But I think the, the, the key is to try to keep people in position, play players in position, because that's how this team is set up to play traditional. Everybody in their own position. Everybody can can replace everybody else positionally basketball. And it's like some rosters are set up for more, you know, diversity in, in what you can do positionally with more positionless players, more two way players with. You know, all 6'10", you could do that with Orlando. But with the Lakers, when you got, you know, players that can only play one side of the ball or guys that only, you know, go up to about 6'3", you got to you got to do things structurally that make a bit more sense. Uh, and that's where I'll, I'll be looking to see what Darvin can do with the roster. Because this ain't a difficult roster to, 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 to play positional basketball with. You, know, you got a control in your hand, you're playing 2K. You just play everybody in position. You're going to have a good team without LeBron James. You just put Rui Hachimura and Troy Brown in there and small forward and then run them shooting guards the way they're supposed to be run. You're going to have to put somebody in a point guard to back up Dennis Schroeder. It'll likely be Austin Reeves. You know what I mean? Or if you're like me, you probably called up Scottie Pippen and he's playing that. But, you know, you can you can get away with that. I think there will be certain lineups where maybe Malik Beasley might be able to help us with being point guard. Although I don't want to ask him to do stuff that he's not supposed to do. Lonnie Walker, I don't really like him at the one. I've never really tried that, though. We never really tried it. But, you know, I don't know who else on this team is the a one. And that's one of those situations where you're like, okay, do the Lakers actually target a one in the buyout? I think that that's just a waste of space. Unfortunately, Will Barton signed with Toronto today, so he's off the board. But do you want to go Derrick Rose or something like that? Because you do, unfortunately, legitimately need another floor general, especially if Braun is out. Uh, again, I like Austin Reeves as a floor, floor general. I trust him as a floor general. 
But for him to play the point guard position, defensively, we know we've had some hit or miss situations, particularly with foot speed. So outside of Dennis Schroeder, that's what I don't see is another pure point guard unless we call up Scotty. And I'm comfortable playing Scotty because I know damn he's damn good. <laughs> I know he's good. So it's not like I'm worried about whether or not nah, he's going to come in. You give him enough minutes, eventually he's going to show you. He's, he's, he's ready for that. He's been ready for that. He's showing that in the G League. So it's just about us using what we actually have. You know, it's the same thing about Jay Huff. I don't like our center position right now. Two reasons. One, Mo's not a reliable player in terms of health. Two, coach ain't using him. But that's a whole other story that doesn't really have anything to do with it. But you can't really count on him to stay healthy. AD can't stay healthy. And then you're looking at who playing the center position outside of Vanderbilt. And you need Vanderbilt to do some of everything. He's roaming, so you may not want him to just be a center. You may want him to guard John Morant. So if that's the case, who's your center? You know what I mean? And in this situation, you find yourself leaning on people that you don't want to lean on to play the center position after that goes a certain way. Bamba gets in foul trouble, AD's not playing, and you got Vanderbilt as your only center. Now you're asking Rui to play center. Now you're doing small ball. <clears throat> you know, and it's just, and these are the type of things it's like, all right, this is why you target somebody in the bio market to kind of help you with that. You know, if there were a, if there was a such thing as a power forward point guard, a big point guard who could play both the power forward and the point guard, Ben Simmons style, but of course not have some of those deficiencies, that would be the perfect player to put in. Obviously, the person like that would be making fifty million dollars. You know what I mean? But that's that's the kind of piece because you want somebody who can do both. So, yeah, you know, I, I don't expect anybody like that's going to be walking through the door. Um, but nevertheless, you, you want the Lakers to try to try to figure this out. You know, Michael Carter Williams signed with, uh, the Orlando magic. I think he went back to Orlando again, not the type of player you're just looking to target, but kind of along the lines, he could play some two, maybe even slip into some threes. Cause he's so tall, definitely play the one, not going to blow your socks off. But once in a blue moon, he had played like the greatest game ever as a rookie and one rookie of the year. So it's like, these are the type of things where if I'm the Lakers, I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to necessarily target him. But based on the structure of the roster, I need me another point guard, and I probably need a little more size down there, and maybe another center. But, you know, all that is is a couple call-ups. That's it. Jay Huff, Scotty Pippen. Problem solved. So it's up to the Lakers to decide to do that. Um, and so that's that's what I'm looking at, man. Kind of bummed that uh, Will Barton's off the bio market, though. <laughs> kind of bummed about that. I'm going to Toronto to be yet another wing in Toronto as if they don't have 167,000 wings. But whatever, they got another. <laughs> so there it is. And, um, you know, the Los Angeles Lakers, we, we push along. Um, so, again, we can we have solutions for any potential roster concern. Uh, and that's what I like. I'm really happy with Rob Palenka. Just as much as we screamed how unhappy we were with Rob, we got to just let him let him get his flowers on it. You know, in regards to these trades that we've made, our team is fantastic. <clears throat> and that's really the only thing you can ask to your GM. Is not make any bad trades. When it's time, make the best trade. And then that's it. That's the job. You know what I mean? So all the other times while we're waiting for him to make those moves, yeah, it's easy to assess what we're looking at. It's easy to look at the things and not be happy with the way they are. We can look at him and say, this is crap. It's still crap. And every day it'd be crap. But leading up to the big moment when he makes the trade or doesn't make a bad trade, that's the only two things that we really need him to assess him on. So as we've learned, we will say when looking at GMs, it ain't much to say until their next move. That's what I can say. That's taken from the entire year and the fullness of looking at Rob Polinka and the various conversations we've had, assessing both before the trades were made and, and all the different you know levels of that, having the team not been good at one point, off season with a locked market and all these different, the fullness of the whole situation. It was very difficult to assess him. We tried. And we thought we were succeeding based on how the team was performing in various given moments, but it didn't tell us the fullness of what it is we were looking at. I think ultimately the video that I made when I was saying that he deserved his extension kind of basically explains the fullness of what it is that I had trouble laying eyes on as the team was struggling every damn day, which was, it's only a couple moves to be made. You keep your mouth shut, you keep your leverage, and then when it's time to strike, you strike it right. And anything else other than that is, is noise, and assessing things that, that are not necessarily within his control until he strikes. And that's the, that's, that's, that's the formula for the GM. You don't want to hear him talking too much. I've heard 
Stephen A. Smith mentioned that he doesn't hear much from the Knicks GM. He wants to hear more from those guys. You will ruin their leverage with the players on their team if they talk too much and say the wrong things. This is what we've learned. The Lakers want to hear more. Laker Nation wants to hear more from Rob Palenka. But when certain players talk, or whether, let's, let's just rip the bandaid off. When Magic Johnson spoke, <laughs> when he spoke on certain things in regards to how much we love certain players and how much we want to keep certain players, it affected our leverage. It affected possibilities of us being hit with tampering and all these different things. So we got to temper what it is that we want from our GM as it pertains to the properness of what it is his job is. You can ask him to do things that make your mind feel better about what it is he's doing, but it will mess up actually what it is that he's doing. Best thing for him to do is this and strike when it's right. And that's, that's what Rob did. So that's ultimately what Jeannie pays for. For him to do those things and everything else that's going on while we're watching the team suck and all these different things, that's not necessarily anything you can do anything about until the time is right to strike. And so that's what we know. That's what we've understood as we've watched this play itself out. And now we think Rob has done a good job. We think Jeannie's extension on Rob seems like to be pretty be, uh, to be a pretty solid decision, given the fact that when he struck, he saved our backsides with two, three moves. Two or three moves saves our backside. So whatever it was that led up to the bad moves that were made that we didn't appreciate, it looks like he learned, and he was a rookie. So my thing is, you can go ahead and fire Rob Palenka if you want, but what we come to understand is, after making those moves, now he's on demand. So if we happen to fire him, he can find another job real quick, <laughs> real quick. And I think that's what Rob Palenka has done for himself. He's given himself the trust necessary within the field to keep a job. So if Genie does move on, he gets another one. So that's what I think this deal just did for him. It saved his backside and gave him credibility within this space. Because that was to be determined based on the bad moves that we made that we really don't know were actually his decisions in the first place. Uh, a lot of TV show us that it weren't. They were not his decision. But it seems to me that the organization and Rob Palenka and LeBron James got on the same page over the last year. And that's why the team is good. That's what I think. Guys were on a different page. They wanted different things. I think they all learned that what they were aiming for needed to be adjusted based on what was possible. Uh, trying to build with three superstars is not wise in the market. It's not the worst thing in the world to want all the talent in the world, but the system's set up to keep you from doing that. So when you do it, you're going to run into some real problems that you don't want. That's what the Lakers learned as an organization. Everybody, all three of the triangles. And now it's like, all right, well, we can move forward together because we know what we were aiming for may not have been possible. So what we were fighting over didn't need to be fought over at all. I think that's where we're at. Building with two superstars is the best way forward. Get us a bunch of players to give us that depth. Keep these guys healthy. It's hard, it's hard to disagree, you know what I mean? It's hard to disagree. When you see how it played out when you tried it with the Russell, when you see how it played out when you did the right thing in 2020 and it worked out. So it's like, this is what we've come to conclusion. It ain't nothing to argue about. Let's just move forward. And I think everybody's on that page. I think the, the Laker organization is fine. Only problem is bronze health. Now, everybody should be popping bottles up until that, that I heard a pop statement. <laughs> we should have been fine. It wasn't nothing to be unhappy about. Everybody should have been happy. And I think to a point, we should still be very happy. <laughs> because the team can actually survive without LeBron James. Now, how far it goes, we know no championship is expected but do i think this team can make the playoffs of course if you've been following me i've been telling y'all for the last three or four videos of course i think this team is just as good as it was before we made the trade you know what i mean we're better than we were before we made the trade without lebron james this team no bron just as good as the team we had we were running around with rush brook and the three small guys so for me it's like all right i still trust us to beat some of these teams a lot more so than we would have if we would have just not made a trade and kept going. This is a better team. We, we can do better things. So let's keep pushing forward. Our hat is going to be held on our rebound and our, our shot block and, and ability to feed Anthony Davis and get scoring from other people consistently. Brian ain't going to be able to get easy buckets, so guys got to take good shots and get easy buckets themselves. I need a lot more driving at the rim. I've come to understand that Dennis Schroeder is a very good driver of the basketball. I didn't pride him as that at any point before the start of the season, but now I understand that's where we can get a good source of rebounding, not rebounding, excuse me, free throws, calls possibly. No Westbrook, no Braun. I think that the key to what we're trying to do today is to continue to try to get interior presence, even though we're going to be dealing with some serious interior defense in Jaron Jackson and, and, and Xavier Tillman. At the end of the day, uh, 
you know, we're still going to need to try to find interior scoring because if we don't, it's going to be a repeat of what we saw against Dallas potentially. And we're going to go down by a lot and we're not going to come back because you're not going to be able to attack in the paint against them like you did Dallas to get back in the game. So the shots we take got to be the shots we make. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's how that got to go. So, and again, as much as has been said about our perimeter defense, I am not pleased. I'm not. We look bad in just about every one of these games since we made the trade in regards to our perimeter defense. We have got to find a way to defend that perimeter a lot better. And, and against a game, in a game where, you know, we're going to be dealing with Kennard and, and Jones and, uh, and Bain, these people hit threes, man. Jaron Jackson, they can hit a three. Obviously, John Morant is a superstar. So if you think for a second that guarding the perimeter is something that you could take lightly against this team because Jaron Jackson's going to be, you know, uh, trying to attack you in other areas and you feel you can you can kill the paint, uh, news flash, they can beat you from behind the arc if they shoot too many threes. This is not one of those teams that you can leave back there and they won't potentially have success. They could. Desmond Bain shoot all night. You know what I mean? Luke Kennard shoot all night. So th these are things that I understand, and I, I just think we need to hunt those players when they're on the floor to assure that they're not in rhythm shooting the shots they want to take. So um, it's a pick-your-poison kind of night. It definitely is with this Memphis Grizzly team. They're going to have certain players that you're just going to have to leave open. You're just going to have to hope they don't hit shots. That's what it's really going to come down to. You're going to guard certain players, and because of what it is that's missing with LeBron James, uh, and because of how, how many different players they're going to be able to use as a just very deep team, they are going to be some pick your poison type of things going on down there. So, you know, as I further think about it, I want Dylan Brooks to be the guy shooting all the shots because I know his efficiency is always off. When I'm watching him, he's a fantastic defensive player. He's going to get under your skin, but he's going to be his worst enemy. He's going to be Memphis's worst enemy because he don't give no dams about missing shots. He's just going to keep taking them. And so if you turn him into a to a, a, a an inefficient shooter or an inefficient attacking player, uh, that might be the key to what we need in in terms of, of throwing them off. Because I'm telling you, a lot of the time when I'm watching Memphis, it's usually him throwing the team off by just attacking but not being efficient, taking bad shots and just letting them fly off the rim. And so maybe that's that's something that we could see a repeat offense of tonight. A 6 or 18 performance from him would be would go a long way, especially if we're rebounding the ball well. Uh, so, you know, if he's efficient, I'll tip my hat. You know, I know he's a high-level player. He can very easily have a good night. But just from my eyesight to what I, to, to you guys, I, I just always tell myself that Dylan Brooks is Dylan Bricks. He's Dylan Bricks. He's always dishing them out. He can build a whole factory. So if we can just turn him into a – a uh, potential score, maybe that'll be the maybe that'll be our way in. Uh, so, I mean, that's what I look at. You know, I really hope Malik Beasley's shot is on fire tonight on the road. You know, I don't know if it's a situation where his game don't travel. Maybe he plays better at home. We'll just have to adjust to that if that's what it is. But if he got it going tonight, we ain't going to have as many problems. That's what it really comes down to. They got to deal with him just like we got to deal with Bain. So, you know. The perimeter is going to be important. How well they guard the perimeter is going to be pretty pretty key. And keeping Jaron Jackson out of foul trouble is going to be key. Because if he gets in foul trouble, that's really our way in. That's our way in. If we can get AD to draw fouls against this guy and have him uh, sitting and then relying upon Tillman and maybe Zoe Saldana or whoever else they can pull off their bench, they might have to go a different route, try to play more uh, Brandon Clark. Force them into that. Force them into that and try try to play our cards with with that type of situation. <laughs> so, getting Jaron Jackson in foul trouble is never too difficult because he stays in foul trouble. <laughs> it's one of the biggest problems with that guy. So, if we can just kind of draw some early fouls against him, maybe get AD attacking him, get to the line, Vanderbilt attacking him, offensive rebounds, forcing him to be physical. I think we can find ourselves in a position uh, to kind of weaken that already weakened interior uh, Memphis squad because without Steven Adams that's a seriously different um, front court and like I said I know Tillman's playing great so it's not like I expect them not to play well but they're smaller you know at the end of the day they can afford to foul fewer times and that is very very important for our front court so Bamba you know I want to use him I keep saying this but this is the type of game you put him in there man you don't allow yourself to not play size tonight because you do have the ability to match up with them with forwards, and that's something that they're able to not necessarily run into too often. 
You know, the Memphis Grizzlies tend to run into teams just like the rest of us that don't have that problem. They oppose the interior defensive presence, not necessarily any of their opponents in most nights. So we got that. We got it all up and down the roster. Rob Palenka made sure we had our centers and lengths down there to help AD. So uh, I don't I don't want to see us uh, lean too too much on anybody uh, unless that hot hand is, is really, really hot. And so that's my point of view on this game. But the game starts up very soon. Uh, we're about an hour and a half away from tip-off in Memphis. And uh, like like we know, the, the environment's going to be serious. That Shannon Sharp incident is going to make it so that they – are going to want to have some energy for us in their building. And as I told you guys last time we played Memphis, it's a different culture over there. It ain't a big deal if somebody gets in somebody's face in Memphis. Not in this era. <laughs> it's on fire there, both on the, on the court and off. It's, it is definitely a hot time in, in, in Memphis, Tennessee. So, uh, you know, you go there and you, and you respect what it is. Uh, but at the same time, you go there with not too much respect because at the end of the day, we have an NBA championship in the last couple of years. They do not. So that's what it really comes down to. Anthony Davis is a champ down there, and I expect for him to, to hold himself with a certain level of respect that the rest of the league is not giving him right now. That is, you can lead this basketball team, a good basketball team, past the rest of the field, with or without LeBron James. you got a good team. You're Anthony damn Davis. And so if he ain't coming in here with that type of respect and looking to continue to win these games, whether LeBron is out there or not, then it's going to affect how people look at him. This is your time to really prove that you're a superstar, A.D., and there's a lot of people who said you're a legitimate number two, and I think we've all been okay with that. But we also know that you're really a legitimate number one, and that's that's ultimately what your actual usage should be. You're Joel, you're Jokic, you're Doncic. You just don't have that role. And so you have it now. It's time for the Lakers to feature you that way. His own team got to give him that respect. He has to respect himself in that regard and go out there and be that. And then from there, the opponent will respect him and, and, and have to deal with it, too. So that's what it is. It's the Anthony Davis time. This is his time. This is AD time. This is not This is not anything but him in his prime with a, with a, with a red carpet laid out for his talent. And so if he, ain't, if he ain't up for the challenge, I don't know what to tell him. And like I said, he ain't had this type of help defensively before, in my opinion. We won the championship. We had a bunch of old guys. We got through it. You know, when he, you know in uh, New Orleans, did he ever have a running mate? With the exception of Boogie Cousins. And Boogie ain't no defender like that. Did he ever have a running mate like that? Drew Holiday obviously was. A fantastic, amazing A-level defender. But that's a guard. He finally has somebody like Vanderbilt that does the things that he does. Take pressure off of him. And then give him elite weak side help. And so with elite, with another elite defensive player next to him. I think he has something that he's never had. That can help him uh, feature, be featured as a star in ways that maybe he's never been featured in his career. So while people have said, oh, he ain't never led no team, what was he leading? Somebody, somebody go back and look at some of those New Orleans rosters and tell me that wasn't a bunch of garbage and Drew Holiday. A bunch of garbage and Buddy Yield. You know what I'm saying? It, the team was trash every year. He was never he never had a good team. We went to playoffs one time. The team was awful. So the GM there didn't do nothing for Anthony Davis in 10 years' time, period. Honest. Not going to lie about it. So when you say he hasn't led a team, what the hell was he leading? This is the best team he's ever led. This right here tonight is going to be the best team he's ever played on by himself. And I'm telling you right now, he needs to start acting like it. He needs to act like it. He don't look over and not see Braun and be like, oh, no, nah, not when you have his talent. Not when you can drop 60, 25, and 7 blocks in the same game. Nah, there is no one on the floor tonight that's better than Anthony Davis, John Moran. I'm sorry. You're not better than him. And that's not just to slight job. That's just to show Anthony Davis. This is the truth. You got to you got to step up. Kobe minute salute. It is what it is. We're not going to play around about Anthony Davis's talent just because he doesn't necessarily display that he believes he's that. And so everybody else is falling in line. The numbers going to tell you he's better than Ja. He's better than a lot of dudes. Better than Jaron Jackson and Ja together because he do both of what they do. Score on one side, defend on the other. He's, he's both of them. So this is what I have to say about Anthony. I don't care if the world believes you this. I don't care if anybody else believes you that. At the end of the day, you've already shown us you are that. And so all the other stuff about you not being able to make the playoffs with a very good Laker team, just because the old man Braun is gone, you should take that with the highest level of, 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 of disrespect. 
especially since you got a championship to your belt. And the, t and the players that they saying you're supposed to be bowing to ain't got a championship to their name. I don't know how he feel about that. Me? I can't live with that. Everybody getting 70. Everybody getting blocked eight shots a night. I'm going to play my best basketball just because y'all disrespect me like that. I got an NBA. I got a ring. I got a ring. And everybody hit me off with the, you know, you, the Mickey Mouse championship. That's a, that's a Mickey Mouse championship. None of y'all won. I won that. <laughs> so that's how I got to be if I'm Anthony Davis. I don't know how his spirit feel about this, but I'm looking at all this talk about the Lakers falling off. I'm looking at the minus nine. Memphis is supposed to have a, 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 a plus, you know, an advantage on us of nine points with me on the floor. Okay. And so that's what I'm looking for. If Anthony Davis comes out and doesn't play a really big game, then it just shows us that he just don't have that spirit. It just ain't, it just ain't in him. He's a guy, but he can always be a number two, and you got to have that bra to keep him going. But his talent, his talent ain't telling us that. His talent tells us he's a number one, and even Braun should be scooting to the side when it comes to this guy defensively. That's what his talent tells us. So at some point, his consciousness and his talent go have to meet so that we can meet teams in the finals because that's exactly where he can lead us with this unit if he's himself. If he was the guy he was back in December or whatever that was when he was going for 50 and 60, you don't need LeBron James to, to, to take this roster, this roster, to where it needs to go. Nah, that person's talent can take this roster where it needs to go. Period. So that's where I'm going to leave it. My name is BDL44. I thank you all for watching.